Hey everyone, thank you so much for coming back to the podcast. Today I'm genuinely grateful and so excited for our next guest. He genuinely doesn't need an introduction, but last time I did it, he said he really liked it, so I'm going to do it again because that's that's always a nice thing to do. So he's an actor, activist, comedian, and someone who I truly believe is a amazing thinker in the realms of philosophy, spirituality, politics, and life. I'm so excited to dive in to his fascinating life, which I believe he's had one of the most fascinating ones. He is none other than Russell Brand. Russell. Thank you again for that introduction. I was enjoying that. Yeah, well, you deserved it, like Thank I said you. last time. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you for doing this again. It's great to be back with you. Congratulations on your podcast. Thank you. I appreciate that. It was wonderful being on yours. Yeah. This is the world now, just people podcasting each other. I suppose ultimately there'll be a time when no human interaction is not subsequently released as a podcast. Yeah, well, I think that's what happened, right? People had amazing conversations and then they thought, oh, I wish we could have shared that with someone. And now? And, and now they do. <laughs> so I remember last time we were together, it's actually been just a year since I interviewed you for recovery, which wow. was awesome. I was looking at that the other day, which was beautiful to be with you on the, the feedback we got for that live broadcast last year. I think like over two and a half million people saw it and the amount of energy we had for it was absolutely amazing. I was very impressed and for a while afterwards I couldn't do an internet video without going, press like, press, just let me see a little heart, a smiley face. But then I, I couldn't keep up the enthusiasm, Jack. Oh, yeah? That is why we need you. <laughs> well, yeah, I'm not doing it this time because it's not live so I it's, can't ask for that. No. But we were together in Ireland. So the last time we were together, we were in Ireland on a beach because you were shooting a movie mm. and you were kind enough to invite us into your trailer while you were getting your makeup done and wearing your outfits. Tell us a bit about that. We were doing, I was doing a children's film. It was called Four Kids and It. And now everything I do in my life is weighed up against, is it gonna be as enjoyable to me as doing my daughter's bath time where I get to spend good quality time with them, mucking around, and it's one of my favorite things to do. So I only really do work if it doesn't get in the way of parenting. I've been like, you know, I've done, had a long period of my life where I wasn't a parent and now so parenting, that's it for me, you know, like at this stage, there might be a bit where I get bored of them. I'm <laughs> considering that as a possibility. So like doing that film out there, Radhanath Swami, a friend and teacher to both of us, was kind enough to come visit us in County Wicklow, Ireland, also to do the podcast as usual. Heaven forbid that a conversation should occur without being recorded and subsequently downloaded. So, you know, on the last day, I was writing about it funny enough today because I've like written a book on mentorship and Radhanath Swami is one of the mentors that I write about in that book. And I wrote about that occasion and how strange it was to be in a trailer with you, a couple of other guys, Sandy Pan, our mutual friend, and Radhanath Swami, and of course my own father, and thinking how unusual that felt, those sort of those worlds colliding, and Radhanath Swami telling those stories from the Bhagavad Gita. You know, and in a sense those kind of those kind of encounters are demonstrative of a new life where my past is coalescing with my future where different groups of my friends are starting to meet in the past I, things were quite atomized for me i was quite insular and solitary and quite i don't know i'm still quite protective i suppose but in a different way so now you know if i do make a film then i'll make a film where i can bring my kids you know if i do do podcasts i try to do it in a way that doesn't disrupt you know my connection to my family so Things have changed, and that little experience there of making that kids' film uh, and, and the encounter that you and I had there, in a sense, is emblematic of this transition. Yeah, it was an amazing conversation, and it's, it's fascinating to see that transition, because did you, ever, did you always dream of being a father? Was that always a step you wanted to take? Did you want to have yes. children? Yes. I, like Almost as soon as I stopped being a child, I wanted children. I really liked children a lot. When I was sort of like 15 or 16, I like, I, so there's something about them... I suppose what it is, is that the unstructured connection that they have, which most evidently is observable through play. The way kids play, for me, makes me very, very happy. Mm. That you can just invent what your situation is. And my daughter now is just reaching that age where you can, that's what she'll do. Oh no, Lucy's stuck in the mud. You know, even though Lucy is. <laughs> Let's get Lucy out of the mud. You hold on my pajama. You hold my jamas. We have to get Lucy out of the mud, but no sooner have we got Lucy out of the mud, then she's in a tree. This kid's got no respect for reality, <laughs> the way that reality is configured according to material situations. 
For her, Lucy is always on the precipice of being stuck in the mud or caught in a tree. And it's our duty to get them back. I feel some of the storylines might be being plagiarised from the Disney version of Winnie the Pooh. Right. Although the central character, Lucy, seems to be her own construction, unless that has been taken from Ben and Holly, the kids' show. Either way, it's a kind of hip-hop editorialising of various media into her own imaginary narratives. The, they say that hip-hop were the first post-modern art form. Uh, and now children's play is this wonderful collage of mm. influence and I want in. Do you still have play yourself? Is there something that you feel? Because I feel as adults, a lot of people I know, I spoke to uh, the founder of ClassPass, who's a good friend of mine, and she was talking about how as a CEO, she really believes that one of the things we lose as adults is play. Mm. And you just brought that up and I'm just thinking that reconnection of play in our own lives. Is that something that you have a form of? Yes. I have, like, firstly, I will say this, that a, a very good friend of mine, Emma Kenny, who you should have on your podcast, said that uh, sex is adult play, that in a healthy relationship, your sexuality should have a, an air of playfulness in it. So that's something that I think about and aspire to. Elsewhere in my life, in my friendships, like, I like... I've always enjoyed people, I guess that's why I like comedians, is like people that you can start talking about stuff and you sort of know that what you're talking about is not really real or something, but you'll just inhabit in a role. Of course I'm a performer as well, and a performance requires play. It requires play. Mm. Now from, you know, you and I are getting to know each other more, you have a lot of uh, spirit, you are running deep, you know, so you have a kind of a, sort of a very, what seems to me a very natural, monastic, uh, sage-like quality, you know. I'm not saying that that doesn't mean the play is accessible to you. I'm sure it is. But for me, coming from the background that I do of a performer and an entertainer, play is vital. The trickster energy, the energy of none of this is real, don't take this stuff seriously. You know, it's found in a lot of deities that I like, you know, sort of like in Krishna, for example, there's a lot of hey, mischief. Yeah. Mischief. Yeah. I like that stuff. Now, mischief is a risk because we live in an orderly material world of regulation. But I suppose the idea of play is you're not hurting no one. Yeah. I wanted to talk to you about a few things today. And one of, one of the first things was, and I don't know if you know this, one of the most Google's things is, is Russell Brand married? And, and obviously, I know Laura, your wife, she's, she's wonderful and amazing. That's me and Googling that. Yeah. <laughs> Is he? Making who's sure. this person in the bed? <laughs> Where are these credit card bills coming from? <laughs> you you making sure, just check it in with yourself. But it's, it's so fascinating to me because, and I, and, I, and I meant what I said earlier, you've lived an incredibly fascinating life already, and you continue to do, but every part of your life's been so well documented by the media. And I, sh I use the word well loosely, but your life has been documented by the media. And, and how has that felt for you? Like, to, how has that felt from an experiential point of view? I feel like today, the reason why I ask it is people are listening, my audience, people are just struggling with their lives being documented by their own social media profile. Like people are struggling with that, but you've had your life documented by people you don't even know. It can make you feel a kind of distinction and separation from yourself, like a part of you gets taken away. In fact, when I first got famous, I was friends and still am friends with Jonathan Ross, the broadcaster, mm -hmm. the English broadcaster. And he said, you lose something when you become famous and you never get it back. And what it is, is a kind of privacy and a sense of who you are. Now, at the beginning of my life in public, I didn't have any regard for privacy because I didn't, I wasn't that kind of person, you know, I was, I liked being famous, I liked performing, I was single and so I didn't regard myself in that kind of way. It's how it feels like is a, the illusion sometimes become more powerful than the truth but I, perhaps everyone experiences that. In a sense, fame is simply an amplification of what we all experience. We all know what it's like to be gossiped about. We all know what it's like to have people not like you and then attack you. you know, and in fame, you experience these things in amplification. So in a, way, in a way, it's very alien, but in another way, it's very ordinary, just by degree is different from mm. the normal experience. So in time, at times it's been frustrating because I sometimes you want to control your own narrative and you want to control what other people think of you, which obviously is impossible. And so it's at times been quite challenging because I've wanted to go, no, that's not what I said, that's not what I meant, I meant this. And 
And my journey as a person with a public profile has been one of relinquishing that control, accepting the terms of fame, accepting that I'm here now and trying to renegotiate so that I, I can be somehow useful in this role. I, I think you're one of the few people who can probably say that authentically because I was saying this to you earlier and I said I'd bring it up. I was watching the start of your new Netflix show that's about to come out, in de- that's coming out in December, so it will have come out by the time this comes out. But, mm. but in that show, you start off and you talk about how you realize, you, you make a great joke about how, actually, why don't, why don't you explain it? It's probably better you explain it. You make a great joke about how, you know, you're out here to send a message, et cetera, and then also to monetize. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I say that it's very difficult to make a living in media if you spend all your time criticizing all media. Yeah. Like I learned <laughs> that I was using, like if you use your position of fame to attack the way that fame and celebrity functions, then eventually you're going to cut the head <laughs> off the serpent. The serpent's like going to stop. I mean, in, in the end, you can't ride that forever. So there was a... It was a sort of a curious time because I suppose we've talked about mental health. And in a way, what happened to me is I reached a point of total disillusionment because I reached saturation in terms of my own, in a way, my own expectations as celebrity. I would have liked, there were points in my life where I would have liked to have been as famous as, say, Tom Cruise or as famous as Will Smith or as famous as, you know, I don't know, famous, famous people. But like when I was very close into that world, it found it very something in it made me recoil and not at ease with myself. Mm-hmm. Not that I made a deliberate choice to leave, but in this, like it's created a kind of spasm in me that I didn't have much control over. Subsequent to that, I experienced a sort of death, a kind of death of what I thought I wanted, even though, Jay, I was never, you know, I'm not a bloody idiot. So I knew that fame wouldn't. Uh, entirely, excuse me, grabbing a tissue. I sort Over. of knew that fame would not be, um, I knew it wouldn't work. Just got me an old uh, plastic bag <laughs> yeah. here. Yeah. I keep tissues. Is that the baby bag or the. No. No, it's actually just mine. Oh, right. Just okay. see the baby bag. <laughs> this is a bloody thing. It looks too organised. I know. Well, let me like tell you. Baby bag. I'm not the genius behind the construction of that device. Right. Um, so I knew even when I was little, even when I was really little, I thought, I want to be famous. If I'm famous, I won't be me anymore. I will have escaped me. But uh, I also knew that it definitely wouldn't work as a technique. But then it's still sort of weird when it actually happens. And this same lesson has been taught to me in many ways through drugs or sex or you know, money, mm. lots of ways. Not that it's been as... I know there are people that are more extremely famous, more extremely wealthy, have more sex. I know all of those kind of things. But for me... Uh, I suppose I'm like an idiot student of spirituality. That it's like, well, I just really will check that sex doesn't work again. Like, and then before going, yeah, no, it definitely, definitely doesn't. It definitely doesn't. It's definitely not the answer. But these things are seductive for a reason. Temptation is not ugly. Temptation is beautiful. Absolutely. And you said you, sp- you wrote your book, Mentors, which I'm super excited about. Because tell us a bit about the few people that are in there. And how they've helped you maybe come to terms with some of these things that you just mentioned there. Who are those mentors? What are the topics that vary across that book? Once I met this guy, I was hanging out with Puff Daddy, of all people. Okay. And this guy that was mates with Puff Daddy, he was called Tracy. He was pretty cool. And he used this metaphor, which I've not used in the book, and I realise now that perhaps I should have done. He goes, life's like a computer game. You get trapped on different levels. And until you can master that level, you'll be trapped on it. He goes, you obviously was trapped on the drug level. Then you get trapped on the sex level. You've got to transcend these different levels. Now, for me, these levels are overseen or you're helped ferried across by mentors. When I was a drug addict, I met Chip Summers. And Chip Summers was the first person I met that was clean. He was a worse drug addict than I'd been. He would have been in prison for armed robbery and stuff. I was never, never served a custodial sentence. So when I heard this guy talking about I don't take drugs anymore, even though he, there were lots of things that were different, he's an atheist, I'm not an atheist, I was able to sort of somehow download from him or he were able to transfer to me, like any good teacher will, something that was latent within me, but I was not in a position to realise. So he was the first mentor that I had. I made the decision, this is like... At first, I didn't know it was possible. Like you say, you can't be what you can't see. I didn't know it was possible to not be a drug addict. I thought that was the solution. Then I saw people not being a drug addict, and then I was willing to do what he said. In this case, 12-step recovery, which I believe is a good solution for anyone with addiction issues or anyone that wants to change themselves, actually. 
then like um you know then i got kind of caught up on other stuff the sexual behavior the obsession with fame pleasure individualism and then i met a series of different mentors including spiritual like you know devoted spiritual people such as radhanath swami who we both know amma the great indian saint um and uh then like people that are more <clears throat> what do i want to say parochial like my mentor jimmy who's like a very successful producer and manager of a production company who's got four kids, been married a long time, doesn't drink or take drugs like me, hasn't for longer than I have, who's quite a solid person from a background I identify with, uh, who's intelligent and lucid. So like, I watched this person and it was very practical mentorship. It's like, I, if I'm at the point of a decision, like I'm gonna do this, Jimmy, I'm thinking of doing this. Do not do this. <laughs> I do what he says instead. So I'm already on a different path now. I'm, I'm using a consciousness that is not my own. I'm accessing external consciousness. So in a way, I know it's bloody simple. It's just following advice. But we don't have, you know, we come from similar worlds, similar backgrounds. We don't have mentor traditions in bloody Essex or Wood Green. No one says, right, emulate this guy. This person is connected. You have to find them by chance and by circumstance. And sometimes you don't even know that that's what you need. You know, so through my life, once I was switched onto it because of the good fortune of being a drug addict, I became more alert to the possibility of doing it. So I started to look at, oh, I like this guy. I want to emulate him. It could be like a comedian, like Bill Hicks, where like he was sadly already dead by the time I'd become a comedian. But I thought, oh, I like how he does that. And mm. I model myself on that man. And like, oh, what, what does he do? Of course, with, you know, when you're constructing your identity, you everything is about trying to connect to your own essence. Mm -hmm. So you're not going to, you know, like I'm not from Texas. I'm not like I don't use anger in the same way as he does. I mean, there's all sorts of distinctions, you know, and I, you know, so, you know, my, like I, a little bit of Kenneth Williams, a little bit of Richard Pryor, a little bit of Peter Cook. You just copy the people that you admire and it helps you to become yourself because the latent energies within you will be realized if you have the external coordinates to follow, but don't get obsessed or fetishize the external coordinates, in which case you're just mimicking and you mm. won't engage your own essence. Yeah, and I'm glad you touched on that. Like, what is that difference in your mind on imitation versus emulation? Like that mimicking versus actually finding yourself through that process because I, I couldn't agree with you more. I, I genuinely feel that we live in a society whereby the pinnacle of success becomes our validation or metric of how we measure ourselves. Mm. So right now, for example, you know, Kylie Jenner's just become the youngest billionaire in the world at 21. Mm. Every 21 year old's going, oh God, I'm not a billionaire. You know, and it becomes the new pressure. So it becomes the imitation, or you see someone who's popular on social media by doing a particular activity, you think, oh, I need to imitate that to get that result. What is that difference between it being a search for self versus a sabotage of self? Maharishi Maharesh said, discernment is the most important thing, discernment. And then I spoke to Jordan Peterson and he mm -hmm. said, judgment. So in a, it's interesting, isn't it, that someone like the Maharishi would not say kindness, love, compassion, mm, but would yeah. say discernment, knowing what path to follow. In terms of mentorship and emulation, I would say in a connection, it's very difficult not to want to mimic stars or billionaires. But I would say we must become attuned to what is timeless. And economic success is emulating social power. It's the idea of, oh, like what, what can we infer from the wealth of Kylie Jenner, is it? Kylie, yeah. Kylie Jenner. Like, is that, oh, she's powerful, she can do what she wants, she's made something of her life, she's glamorous, she's potent, she's powerful. Like, so the timeless in that is, I suppose, power. The temporal in that is economic success. All, it's gonna die, it's gonna mm. go. Kylie Jenner, like all of us, will die. The money will die. The globe itself, the entire planet, will die. So if you've spent your time festooning and ornamenting your temporary vehicle instead of the timeless, which is con in continual dialogue with the temporal and external, then you have missed the point. So if I sort of say, I like Bill Hicks because Bill Hicks speaks the truth, Right. And I so I will speak my truth rather than I'm going to wear these clothes and put on this accent. Then I've you know don't learn the wrong mm, lesson. Mm. You know, and like a lot of times in my own life, I learn the wrong lesson. I learn, oh, you know, like Hollywood stars, they seem to be above 
problems and above the filth that I feel contaminated by, I'll become a holocaust. Oh no, the filth has come with me, mm. you know, because I learned the wrong lesson. The real lesson, the real work is done inwardly. I suppose how to make this evaluation, Jay, would be to, this is why good mentors, because you can't always trust yourself. Mm. I can't always trust myself. I'm, I still am capable of making dumb decisions. I still Me might too. go. I, like you say with your seed and weed technique, which I adore, I, like that I might sort of try and convince myself, that's a seed. Yeah, And like might lead someone else to go, that's a weed. Yeah. You idiot. How can you try and sell that as a seed? Oh, no, it could be a seed. Because really what you want to do, you know, the, the power, prestige, privilege, these things, I like them. Part so of me wants do. it. I want the glory, the adornment, to be garlanded in wonder, to be kissed and loved and licked. But I've been there now, and it's very temporary. <laughs> and yeah, it's that confirmation bias, right? We're always trying to find the information that justifies our belief. Yes. So if we want to switch and make ourselves feel, oh no, I am happy doing this because he or she's happy doing it, we find a way. Yes. We find a way. But what's fascinating about what you've done, and this has genuinely been, I think I've wanted to ask you this since we've been friends and known each other, and I'm glad I get to ask it to you today because I think it's probably one of the hardest things to do, genuinely. I feel like you're someone who has multiple times reinvented themselves and not reinvented for the sake of branding or marketing, but in bringing out your truth in different ways. Oh, thanks. That's a good compliment. Right. And I, and I mean, no, I'm saying I'm genuinely saying it like I don't think it's been a marketing or a branding attempt. I believe it's been an attempt to, to be authentic and genuine at every moment in the way that I've seen it. But yes. you, you, you started off, and we were talking about it earlier, you started it off, you were, you, were, you, know, you were the host at Big Brother, the digital edition, etc. And then everyone knew you as this, you know, eccentric, crazy, wacky individual, you know, charismatic, captivating. And, and I've heard people who, who worked with you behind the scenes say he was extremely charming behind the scenes too. And, so it's, and, and there are parts of that which you've kept. And there's parts of that which you let go. And then we saw Russell Brand, of course, the actor. And then you moved into acting in Hollywood. And I know everyone that I speak to in America about you absolutely adores you and loves you for the movies that you made. And then we have you coming back and playing a more activist role. And then even in politics and now spirituality and philosophy and culture and society. And I feel like that must have been so difficult because I don't think, and you may see it differently, but from my, my point of view, I never really saw you completely step away to come back. I never really, I see a lot of people, especially celebrities or people who are trying to find their truth and find their why, they kind of go away into hiding and then sometimes emerge in an interview and don't always make complete sense <laughs> because they're still trying to make sense of what they're finding. But you almost have kept your personality and who you are, but then engaged and explored all these fascinating things. This has been fortunate, this Jay, when you yeah. put it like that. In a sense, we all have our game, don't we, and our strategies. Some of us are attracted to the more high stakes game where you could be humiliated, exposed or attacked or killed. And I think what happened is that even though I, in various periods of my life, have taken on the tools and ephemera of the culture, i.e. I want to be on the TV and dress up and be all famous or I want to go to Hollywood or whatever. Something in me always knew that these things would pass and are not real. And I've kept a healthy dialogue with that, perhaps because I'm an addict and the, an addict has to be aware of pain continually and otherwise the pain will end in self-destruction. So it wasn't um, a conscious, right, I better reinvent myself. It was in each case a sort of, crisis that felt beyond my control like just like, oh well, this isn't working anymore i can't do that no more that doesn't seem real anymore not even really cognitive i moved back from america when i fell in love with somebody in england i got like the thing with politics for example was i i remember i feel like i asked myself the question and my mate gareth that i was working with a lot of the time then what will happen if i just start saying what i actually think about politics and then put it on the internet. What will happen? And then I watched what happened. And it felt like, I'd always felt that. Like for take the very obvious example of I said, there's no point voting because the, op uh, the op opportunities for change are minimal and ultimately meaningless. <laughs> I had always felt that. That's why I had never voted. And pretty much everyone I knew felt like that. I didn't belong to groups of people that were like, well, I'm a Democrat or I'm a conservative. Everyone was just like, well, that's just that 
thing where everyone mm -hmm. pretends that ordinary people can have power while these institutions protect their own interests. Everyone sort of knew that, whether intellectually or just more viscerally. So I started talking about it in the same way of, through performance, through comedy, because the point of comedy, in a sense, is revelation. Mm -hmm. Revelation of what is previously being concealed. That's what is exciting about comedy is that it puts you in touch with an ulterior reality. Like that, you know, we know, we suspect, we pray and meditate on that whilst we accept the conditions of this conversation that you're embodying that conscious entity and I'm embodying this conscious entity, we both know that they're going to die. We wonder what is the energy that's behind it? Where will that energy go? Of what is that energy comprised? How did we end up speaking this language? All of these questions fizz invisibly through the air. All of these connections are continually being made. And I feel that you can apply this metric, this tool, this analysis, political device to anything. You can start to say, well, what is politics? Who does it serve? How is it constructed? Well, why is this system still in place? Why has it not progressed when clearly the technology to change it ha ha has or, or evolved? Whose interests are being protected? Why are these conversations not had? Why is this information not conveyed? Why is that, you know, and if you start asking those questions, things start just peeling away and peeling mm. away. You can ask it of yourself. You can ask it of someone you love, which is a cruel thing to do anyway. <laughs> but, or you can ask it of the institutions that are around you. So, in a sense, the thing that's, you know, you shed your skin like a serpent, you know, and you sort of go on. But, like, behind it, the energy is the same. And my belief is while there might be an essential distinction between you and I, that you are some very particular expression of the whole and the divine, as everyone is, that we are all somehow in continual communion with something that's bigger than us, bigger than this. How could it not be? How could our little minds understand all reality? How could this be all that there is? And how did you get into that? Like, how did that journey start? So we're talking about all these reinventions, but that particular... What, spiritual curiosity? Yeah. Where did that come from? Like, why did they... Drugs. Just... Right. Because I think if you start taking drugs, yeah, you start thinking, I'm trying to kill this thing. Mm. Like, it's not working for me. And if you take things like hallucinogens, the hallucinogens will... Yes make you physically experience, oh no, I'm not me. I remember that feeling being quite young, sort of 16, wow. taking acid and the sort of, the horror actually, the horror uh, because I was not, you know, I was just doing it with other lads. I wasn't around bloody gurus. Yeah. You know, like, so I'm just thinking, oh no, I'm not me. I'm not me, this is not good, who am I then? You know, and there's no one there to go, that's really beautiful, isn't it, that mm. you're not you, because it means that you are everyone and you are everything, and all those things you've told yourself and your language and your culture and your gender and your identity are all just biological or social programs that you are exhibiting. I just thought, bloody hell, whose hands are these? And it was scary. So, but I suppose as I am getting older, I'm becoming, uh, like, you know, in it, like at the end of, is it, am I right in saying that at the end of the Gita, like Arjuna is like, oh, I remember. Like in a sense, we know. We know. There's a reawakening. Huh. Yeah, reawakening. Sorry, continue, continue. I was just, well, like I feel with like you. it unfolds for you. It mm. unfolds for you. And there are moments in life where you're, you're, the trauma, the rupture, the pain of being alive always will become an opportunity for learning if you're able to do it, if you're able to see it in that way. And sometimes in, such, in that pain-based mentality, it's quite difficult to work that trick. Mm. It's quite difficult to go, now, what am I supposed to learn here? What am I, how am I supposed to evolve here? Mm. Now, one thing I like doing on the podcast is making it really, trying to extrapolate from incredible people's lives like yourself some, some practical lessons in that sphere. Because I feel either... If you're watching this or listening to this, you're either on drugs and you've had the same experience. I know plenty of people who feel that way. So definitely there's that group of individuals. And then there's a group of people that just kind of feel that way just because. Mm -hmm. they've, they've realized, well, I don't want to be this. This can't be all there is. And then there's a group of people who are just like, oh, well, actually, that's too far for me to even think about. I'm not even there yet. Mm -hmm. You know, but when you do make that step and you start having originally, like you said, you don't have a guru or sage to tell you, oh, that's a good feeling. Mm. You start having these feelings. What's the next thing you do? Like, what, what do you do from there? Where do you go? Start with the possibility of happiness, I feel. I don't agree mm. with it. Whilst you and I have talked before about asceticism, mm. you know, and denial of pleasure, I feel like the possibility that you can be happy is an interesting thing to invite because I think a lot of people just think, well, this is life, life is miserable, my mum mm. was beat up by my dad, this isn't me personally, I'm just making this example up, uh, you know, like, like I've only ever known misery. 
this like you have to overcome that idea the, even the fact that the possibility of happiness exists conceptually in your consciousness is the possibility of its realization then mm. i feel like you have to accept that you have a problem i.e something that you want to alter and change then you have to accept that there is a way of doing it this is where a mentor is useful in mm. hope in the hope that change is possible then you have to be willing to accept help and I think that can work with any situation, something as evident, chronic and severe as drugs or serious eating disorder or something like, oh, I don't like my job anymore or I don't want to say those kind of things. Say me, if I like, you know, if I think mm, maybe I agree with Jay that I don't want to swear, maybe I think it's bad, then I, now I know you don't do it. So I think, hmm, is it working for Jay? I'll try that. You know, so that's an example of how uh, something that's a potential for improvement it could be deployed in my life and I'll maybe try it out and I'll be aware of it and see if it works for me, you know. Mm. So in a sense, like I'm not too... Uh, don't be married to the negative aspects of your self-belief. You know, if you mm. some, don't like something, you can't... Don't you find you talk to people sometimes and they go, yeah, but I can't change. I'm always like this. Life's like this. Yeah. So I'm like, or someone I spoke to and I go, he goes... Um, yeah, but I don't believe in God in that way. I believe God's in relationships. I go, yeah, but you're not happy. So fuck your belief, excuse my language. <laughs> you know, if your belief's not working for you, let's try something else. Yeah. Let's try something else. Yeah. If it's working, then crack on. I love that point about the openness to happiness. And, and funnily enough, my journey into being a monk and that path of denial was because I believed it would make me more happy. So even then, mm. that was still the seed. That was still the focus, the focal point, that service was linked to happiness. Yes. That selflessness was linked to happiness. I think about this, Jay. You know, when people say, I want to be enlightened, is what they're really saying is, I want to be happy and I totally. want pleasure and I want to not feel pain. And maybe it's not, you know, awful to not want to suffer. But I feel that if you mask the sincerity of your intentions, then you're less likely to... Achieve them totally, and also the way that we avoid the likelihood that our that our journey to happiness or connection or enlightenment or call it what you will will not be doing what we think is right. Mm. It's not going to be what we came up with. Whilst, of course, all of us I feel carry a kind of barometer that says, you, like you with the not swearing, something in you told you I don't want to do that, and you listen to that voice, mm -hmm. and something in me says. Yeah, don't look at porn, Russ. You know, like it's sort of, it's not like I'm not responding to some external puritanical yes. force that's saying don't do it. Although there are enough people that have written down, do not objectify sex, it will mess you up. You know, yeah. people have obviously discovered that for thousands of years, written it down, and I've ignored it. <laughs> you know, like, and like, um, but like uh, when your inner voice aligns with something like that, then you cover possibility yes. of sort of making. A meaningful connection. Yeah, I love that. I've seen you say that in a video that I saw on your Instagram page recently where you were talking about how, how do you feel after you've just done the act? Like yeah. that's kind of a great reflection process of like, for example, masturbation. It's like how you feel after mm. is a great judge of whether you want it in your life or not. Yeah, if you feel great. Maybe was, there's some people that feel like, yeah, yeah. no, I like it. And I'll like, oh, carry on then. Yeah. yeah. Like, although, you know, there is obviously such a thing as mental illness. There are obviously mm. some people that go around doing the most unbelievable things and it sort of works for them. But I feel like as an optimist, I have to believe that if we were to approach those people with the light, that they would not want to do it. You know, I Definitely. don't feel that people would want to cling on to the murder, the pedophilia, oh. if they had a connection to God. 100%. I think people are ready to give up lesser things in any fashion, material or spiritual, or energy for higher energy. Me too. Yeah. What do you I think really... about the thing that Gandhi said ages ago, obviously, quote, like, like, the, you know, like, there's no point in India getting rid of the British, then emulating what the British would do in any way, just with Indians in the roles of power. He said, we've got to break down our country into like 70,000 villages, they should all be autonomous, and we've got to let go mm. of our love of gadgets and stuff. And he was saying this before we were, you know, spending our whole life staring at screens. You know, like you're saying, we, we, at some point, you've got to let go of those low, you know, lower pressures, those, lo yeah. those low vibrational pleasures. And that's what I think is, because people haven't been exposed to higher energy, uh. most of all in their life, and I see it everywhere I go, I'm just, I look back and I'm like, I'm so fortunate that I met someone of really high energy really early in my life. Right. And that's kind of what I feel like what I'm trying to do is, is just how can I expose people to great energy early in their life because then they at least know it exists. It's almost like, I was, I was, and this is 
a totally different context, but I was speaking to a big media company recently and they were saying how they know that when they make celebrity gossip, etc., it gets big views and big likes and big shares. But one of them is a bit more conscious and intentional and pushed a very important piece around mental health and reform and recovery. And when they did that, the views went even higher. And she was just saying that actually taking a more highbrow attempt at media, taking a stance, having an opinion that wasn't necessarily diving into our lower desires to just learn about gossip and sex and all the issues actually brought people into it. And so it's interesting how we sell people short through what we create. That's a cool point. I mean, like our sort of love of God or truth or purity or whatever you want to call it, it shouldn't just be like supporting a football team. If you're saying, oh, I like this one, this is the one I've happened upon. It's because it actually will work. Mm. You know, you have to actually believe. Like, like I understand empirically with drugs, no, Russell, don't take drugs. It won't do what you think it's going to do. It will yeah. temporarily distract you from pain and then the pain will be even worse. I, it's a harder lesson to learn around sex. It's harder to go, no, don't have sex. You will feel worse afterwards, except obviously within, in my case, in a happy uh, monogamous relationship. Like, so, but, and then even more hard to learn, oh, don't go out and try and adorn yourself with sort of glory and you know expensive garb or care too much about what people say. You sort of keep thinking it will work. And obviously, as that uh, example suggests, people do think, no, looking at this you know, video that says we might catch a glimpse up someone's skirt or hear some scintillating bit of tittle tattle, you know, it still kind of works and it's, but, but we are right. We are right. Like you can't get past hate with more hate. You can't get past lust with more lust. But within love, within some pure consciousness, it must be housing all of it. That that the time is resting on timelessness. That if you can somehow get by it, if you can get by it, it will be more powerful. That's I suppose what faith is. Mm. Well said. Thanks. Yeah, thanks. Really well thanks. Said. So I'm going to go into, we've got five minutes, I'm going to go into the final five questions that I always oh, do in the what last do. five minutes. Good format yeah. in. Nick that. <laughs> <laughs> the final five. The and final now it's five. time for the Terminal 20. <laughs> our unique item on Under the Skin. Yeah, so I'm going to go into these five questions. So I actually, for this segment, I went, went to Google because I love seeing what... You really trust Google. I don't trust Google. I like, no, I like, I like, knowing, what, I like knowing what the masses are thinking about. Right, it's I'm a fast, temperature taking device. Yeah, it, it helps me really understand. Do you think they're listening to us? They Google? Pro probably, they better be. Yeah, that's why we're wasting our life. Right? Mm. <laughs> okay, so the, the question was, oh, we've, we've answered this one, I'm gonna skip this one. So this one is, is Russell Brand married? That's one of the most Googled things. Yes, yes. to my wife, Laura Brand, yeah. by coincidence. <laughs> uh, this is another, what is Russell Brand's IQ? Well, I, th I like to think I'm quite clever. I know, I think people do too. That's a question that people... But like that, if you've done an IQ test, it's mostly to do with triangles, mm. isn't it? Put this <laughs> triangle over there. Now what? Hmm? Did they? <laughs> was it? What happened on the Tuesday? So I like to think I've got a high IQ, but there's quite a lot of daily demonstrations of stupidity, <laughs> I'd have to be honest. Well, I remember when The Guardian put you in as the fourth most... Oh yeah, no, clever person, clever person influential yeah, thinker. thinker. In the world, influential oh, thinker in the world. News, yeah, that was good, wasn't it? Because it? it was like Thomas Piketty, Naomi <laughs> Klein, probably like Yanis Varoufakis, like proper like political leaders, yeah. ecologists. And you're number four. Russ. Yeah, it was amazing. Quite right. I love that. Why am I not number one? Yeah, exactly. I thought at the time. <laughs> I love it. Okay, uh, that was yeah. That was the the Russell Brand uh, IQ question. I love this bit of the show, by the way. Oh, good. Well, this is you. really t really tapping into my ego. Thank you. Is Russell Brand vegan? He tries. He's a nice guy. Yeah. <laughs> uh, like, I mean, like what happens with me is uh, eggs, like you know. But like I try to take them in the kindest way. Yeah. Uh, I what I do is I reach into the chicken mm -hmm. just before it's ready. No, I don't do that. <laughs> and like, uh, and like, and like egg, I sometimes like, you know, I sometimes like a little buttery snack. I'm so sorry. I've, vegans are definitely right. I'm not arguing that they're, I'm not saying what's the point of being yeah. vegan. Vegans are correct. Are you vegan? I am. Of course yes. you are. Look at your yeah. eyes. You're disgusting. I remember when you interviewed the happy pair too. No, I love no, those. Yeah. Yeah, those men are beautiful, man. Yeah. You've got to be vegan. You can't argue with whether or not you should be vegan. You know, like people do, no, you've got to eat, just eat. Like some people are taking it to extremes. I only eat meat now. <laughs> what? I'm only going to have salad with it. No way. But like for me, you've got to be vegan for the planet, for yourself, for every reason. The trouble is, you know, eggs yeah. and you. cakes. Weakness, yeah. general weakness. But I'm heading that way. Perfect me will be vegan. And, and the last one is, what is Russell Brand up to now? Gosh, what is he doing? 
Well, I am. Uh, what I'm doing at the moment is being a father to my mm. daughters, a beautiful. husband to my wife, and work has become of secondary importance to me. But I do, the thing that was there in the first place that got me into all that trouble and all of those adventures is still there. It's not gone anywhere. It will need to, at some point, manifest itself. And I'm just trying to prepare myself so that when next time it does it, it doesn't lead to me sort of being destroyed in some way or causing suffering. I want it to realise itself benevolently. And I feel that the only way to do that is to try to avoid making the decision or allowing it to migrate towards the ego. Even things I start with the best intentions, i.e. truths, sometimes the ego gets hold of it. It's very crafty, the ego, mm. isn't it? But that's, but that's the best thing that we have to try because otherwise we don't even see it. Mm. And, and we would often talk about in the monastery that when you're not doing anything out the ordinary, it's easy to think you're humble. Oh. But when you're not actually pushing the boundary, like if you sit alone all day, everyone will think they're humble. But it's when you go out there and you do something like, oh wow, I've got a big ego, I need to work on that. Right. So it's like, if you don't activate, it's easy to start getting comfortable and think, oh, I'm quite enlightened, aren't I? I'm quite realized. But you're actually just neutralized. Yeah. You're not engaged with the worldly yeah. things. Yeah. I like that. Thanks. Anyway, awesome. Thank you, Russell. And I want people to go in, of course, buy the book Mentors, which I'm fascinated to read. Can't wait to read it. I'd like them to Anything that. you'd like to mention on Mentors? Just, uh, no, you can do what you want with that. Just, just and yeah. like, buy it and read it and get yeah. mentors. You don't even need to buy it or read it. You could nick it or you could get the information and just get a mentor. Uh, and that Netflix thing. Yes, absolutely. But by now, that's been and gone. It's totally. February. But I'm going to push that early anyway. Oh, yeah. Yeah. I will just push them into it. Oh, and listen to our podcast, yeah. Under yeah. the Skin, and see how we gracefully steal that last bit <laughs> when I go, OK, now, it's the time, final five questions. I just, I don't know, I just like to go on Google, I guess. <laughs> I've always liked it. So... These are the top five uh, Yahoo suggestions. <laughs> <laughs> Sponsored by Yahoo. <laughs> yeah. yeah. No, I love it. Thank you, Russell. I'm so grateful. Appreciate you. Thank yeah. you, mate. Thank, Thank you for you. sharing your stories. Cheers, man. Appreciate Thank it. you for asking.